Boa tarde. Hello again. Uh, let me first address you a couple of words, perhaps in Portuguese, although I'm saying this in English. Uh, boa tarde a todos. Uh, como se terão já percebido, como é evidente, houve há um atraso da parte da tarde, porque as sessões da manhã prolongaram-se mais do que havíamos previsto, e o professor Gross, que tem um, uma, digamos, uma, uh, uma obrigação internacional às quatro e pouco, uh, digamos, isso colocava em dificuldade que pudesse apresentar a, 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 sua, a sua comunicação, a encerrar como previsto. E por esse motivo, com uh, enfim, o apoio inestimável da professora Jani, nós podemos alterar, inverter a ordem. Portanto, iremos começar com o professor Gross e depois passamos de imediato para a segunda sessão. Vai haver coffee break, mas no final a encerrar a sessão, porque isso nos permite poupar, de certa forma, uma meia hora. Portanto, convidava todos a entrarem, a sentarem-se uma vez que, digamos, iniciaremos de seguida. E now switching again to English, or to the lingua franca, so to say, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Manuel Fiulhais to introduce our guest, Professor David Gross. Thank you once again, and uh, please enjoy those magnificent lectures that we are going to have this afternoon. Boa tarde a todos. It is my honor and great privilege to introduce the speaker of the next special lecture, Professor David Gross. All you know that he was the 2004 Nobel Prize winner in physics, together with Filzek and Pulitzer, for, in the words of the Swedish Academy, for the discovery of the asymptotic freedom in the theory of the strong interaction. Asymptotic freedom is indeed one of the most intriguing and fascinating characteristics of quarks, the building blocks of hadrons. After graduating from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 1962, David Gross received his PhD in physics from the University of California, Berkeley, and then became junior fellow at the Harvard University in 1969 he joined the faculty at Princeton University and became professor there in 1973. In Princeton, he began working with the graduate student Frank Filzek, and that research work led to the discovery of the already mentioned asymptotic freedom, the primary feature of non-abelian uh, gauge theories, and to the formulation of quantum chromodynamics, the theory of strong interactions. David Gross made also seminal contributions to the theory of superstrings, namely with the formulation of the heterotic string theory, which aims at a unified description of all forces of nature, in particular bringing gravity to the quantum world. The lecture today will be about that. From 1997 to 2012, Gross was director of the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics of the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he is a permanent member and holder of the Chancellor's Chair Professor of Theoretical Physics. He holds honorary degrees from universities in USA, in Britain, France, Israel, Argentina, Brazil, Belgium, China, the Philippines, and Cambodia. His memberships include the US National Academy of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, l'Académie Internationale de Philosophie des Sciences, the Indian Academy of Science, the Chinese Academy of Science, the Russian Academy of Sciences, and the World Academy of Sciences. His awards include, among others, the Sakurai Prize, the MacArthur Prize, the Dirac Medal, the Oscar Klein Medal, the Harvey Prize, the European Physical Society Particle Physics Prize, 
Lagrame Daidor, the Medal of Honor of the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, the Nobel Prize in Physics. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Professor David Gross. So thank you for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the rearrangement of the schedule, but I have a, a Zoom meeting I have to attend um, at five o'clock. So, um, the title of my talk is <coughs> The Frontiers of Fundamental Physics. Um, and It is, I often contemplate on what we have actually learned in physics over the last 50 years or 100 years or even the last 10 years. I'm always astonished at how much that is. The last 50 years, which is roughly the time that I've been doing research in physics, the progress in fundamental physics <coughs> has been remarkable. We've understood and discovered and measured the basic building blocks of all matter that we know about and the forces that act on these elementary particles, the constituents of matter. We have mapped the entire, almost the entire visible universe and reconstructed most of its history. And we have uh, extended our understanding of matter to be able to control matter, ordinary atoms, electrons, and nuclei in all of its different phases down to the very nanoscale of atoms themselves. However, I'm, I often make the remark that although understanding how nature works is the goal of fundamental science, the most important product of knowledge is ignorance. Now that provocative statement, of course, does not mean that we are happy about the ignorance that pervades society, the ignorance that leads to racism and bigotry and war, but rather the questions of why and what that we are able to ask because of our increased knowledge. The questions that lay and define the frontiers of knowledge today are questions that we could not have asked 50 years ago because we did not know enough to know where the frontiers of knowledge lay. We uh, require knowledge in order to ask questions. So what I mean by ignorance is intelligent, informed ignorance. But ignorance is what drives science forward. It's the new questions that we're now intelligent enough to ask, questions that can be answered now by observation, by experiment, and by 
theory by, in other words, the scientific method. So uh, my picture of knowledge and ignorance, which I'll expand later at the end of my talk, is that we are immersed in a sea of ignorance and we're pushing outward. The ignorance that we are aware of defines the frontiers of our knowledge and the frontiers of science, in particular the frontiers of physics that I will be talking about, lay at the border between knowledge and ignorance. There are many frontiers in science. There are many frontiers in biology and chemistry. I'm going to mostly discuss those in physics. And here, too, there are many different kinds of frontiers and many wonderful questions that we ask today over an incredible array of scales from the questions about the universe as a whole, whose extent the visible universe today is the scale of 10 to the 26 meters, I'll discuss the, one of the most intriguing frontiers of knowledge to have to do with the strange properties of black holes. That's at a scale of the Earth, or roughly 10 to the 4 meters. Then there's the great progress we're making in quantum matter in understanding the properties of ordinary atoms and electrons at uh, the atomic scale of 10 to the minus 9 meters, but also quantum matter within the nucleus where we, we now explore down to distances of 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's a billionth of a nanometer. And finally, the uh, smallest frontier is that where we are trying to understand the quantum properties of gravity and the unified, uh, a unified description of all the forces of nature, which might take us down to 10 to the minus 35 meters. This is a range of scales of 60 orders of magnitude. Um, but all of these different phenomena, we believe, are, have a common uh, origin and um, are of great interest to the study of basic of, of physics, the basic sciences. So let me start at the largest scale with the universe as a whole. And in particular, are one of the most intriguing and exciting and new kinds of questions that we are beginning to ask about the actual origin of the universe. Again, this is a question that 50 years ago, we simply were not in the position to even begin formulating the question. We have, the universe as we know, uh, began, whatever that means, roughly 13.5 billion years ago. And we have this picture, first picture uh, that we can see, since we, light takes, uh, has, um, takes time to get to us from far off objects in the universe, we can, the farther we see back the older the light is. And the farthest we've been able to see is 13.5 billion years ago, or uh, when the universe was a very, well, it was, looked more like this, a homogeneous hot sphere, isotropic, homogeneous, of gas, 
with small imperfections, small regions of denser matter. Uh, but these features that we see in the cosmic microwave background, the light that has taken over 13 billion years to get to us, are only imperfections at the level of a tenth, a hundredth of one percent, one part in 10,000. The fact that there were such little imperfections, this region that is denser and hotter, this region that is less dense and cooler, is why the universe evolved and we understand in some detail how this happened to form the strands of matter and ultimate the galaxies and the stars that uh, we see today. Gravity pulls on matter and if there is a region that's slightly denser than its neighbors, it will collapse to form these strands of matter and ultimately stars and galaxies. That much we understand in great detail. The subsequent history of the last 13 billion years is very well understood, although much of the fascinating details are still being worked out. And we can try to extrapolate and see what will happen in the future. We have discovered that the universe has much more matter than we directly observe on Earth, dark matter. We've discovered that empty space has a kind of energy and negative pressure that causes the universe to expand in an accelerated fashion. And we're not only posed to ask the question, but in a sense we need to ask the question how, what happened at the beginning? How did this all begin? At the beginning, however, all of our approaches, so successful in understanding most of the history of the universe, break down. People talk about the Big Bang. Sometimes they refer to that hot sphere of gas, 13 point three billion years ago. Sometimes they refer to the beginning, whatever that meant. So we don't really know. How did the universe begin? Well, it's very hard to answer that question without experimental data. And it's very difficult because before that hot sphere of gas, the universe was filled with particles which stopped the light from reaching us, from escaping from the, that small early universe. How far back can we probe? People imagine using neutrinos or gravity waves to probe even farther back the earliest history of the universe, but Currently, we don't possess those tools. I believe we will eventually. But there's a philosophical question which we've never had to address before. Can we determine how the universe began, the initial condition? In the history of physics, we're used to our, take our job as predicting the future, knowing the present. Of course, if we know the present, we can extrapolate backwards and ask where that came from. But we've never had to ask the question, how did it all begin? And it's not even clear that that's a question that physics can answer, since it never has had to answer before. Um, what does it mean to determine the initial condition? Usually the laws of physics enable you to predict the future given the present. 
but to determine the initial condition, you know, is up to the experimenter or the person who prepares the uh, physical apparatus. So we don't know whether we can determine the initial condition or what it would mean, but we're beginning to ask that question in a serious scientific way. We have the, we know what the universe looked like 13.2 billion years ago. What was the initial condition that produced that universe? And what does it mean to have a beginning of the universe? That's a beginning of space and time. Was there a time before time began? Maybe the universe is cyclic. It expands and contracts, and some people believe in that scenario. We don't really know. This is one of the biggest questions uh, that face us, and it's of great scientific interest now as we explore the universe at an earlier and earlier stage <laughs> and our theoretical tools expand. We also have many questions about what the universe contains. As we have discovered, surprisingly, in the last 20, 30 years, that most of the matter in the universe is not the stuff that we are made out of, protons and neutrons and electrons and such, but another kind of matter. We know it's matter because the way it pulls gravitationally on other matter, but we don't know what kind of matter this is. We haven't yet directly seen it. Indirectly, we feel, or stars, in the universe feel its pull, and it's essential for our description of the history of the universe, but we have no idea what dark matter is, as well as this dark energy of the vacuum. So dark matter was an experimental observational discovery by a great woman, female astronomer Vera Rubin and collaborators who, by measuring the orbits of stars and galaxies, discovered that you need to include in the galaxy stuff you can't see, which is therefore called dark matter. And by now we know that a galaxy like ours, this is the Milky Way, we saw some pictures of the Milky Way in, in Vicky's talk. What she didn't show was the dark matter because it doesn't radiate light. It's dark. But it still pulls on the stars that, like our sun, and affect the orbits of these stars so one can calculate how much dark matter there is and determine that 90% of the matter in our galaxy is this dark stuff, whatever it is. Here's a nicer picture of this is a uh, 60 million light year long, a rather large strand of dark matter. And the way we see that is by what's called gravitational lensing. So any form of matter will pull anything that has energy or matter, including light. So a star, for example, acts like a lens. Light coming from behind the star will be attracted by it and focused inward. And that's something that was predicted both by Newton and then correctly by Einstein and served as a test of Einstein's theory of gravity. And is now used all the time by astronomers to observe matter that can't be seen directly. So this matter here, which is an enormous swath of matter, is, um, you know, is not radiated. This picture is made by observing the distortion of the stars behind this matter 
uh, that are bent, gravitational lensing. But what is this dark matter made of? Well, we don't know. And we have been looking for direct observation of this dark matter for now over 20 years. We look for dark matter and anti-dark matter. Any kind of matter has to have, an, according to our understanding of relativity, anti-matter. And dark matter and anti-dark matter sometimes should meet and annihilate. We could see those signals. Any kind of matter can be produced if you have enough energy in, in the laboratory. So in our high energy accelerators that produce very energetic collisions of ordinary matter, you should produce dark matter as well. Or dark matter should interact perhaps very weakly with ordinary matter. And uh, one, we have built many laboratories deep underground, shielded from any other kind of matter by the rocks. Uh, neutrinos can get through almost anything, so they can be observed in these underground laboratories, but so could dark matter but so far has not been observed yet. This is one of the great mysteries. It's an essential part of our picture of cosmology, of the universe, and uh, will for sure be discovered in the next decade. I used to say that a decade ago, so. But it, since it is there, uh, it will be seen eventually and we'll understand it. The vacuum, it appears, has energy content. It's called dark energy. Uh, and it was observed very indirectly since it, it's everywhere and rather um, low value per square centimeter. Uh, it's only measurable effect to date and perhaps forever is on a cosmological scale. But it was observed and responsible for the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. The universe has been expanding, we've understood for 100 years at a constant rate, but now we've measured its acceleration, that expansion the distance between any two points in the universe is growing. It's not like an explosion. Every point is expanding with respect to every other point. It's like bread in an oven expanding um, when it's heated. And that, according to our understanding of gravity, of Einstein's gravity, uh, is due to <coughs> an energy and a negative pressure permeating the whole universe. Um, that's how it was observed. But it could very well be, as Einstein realized when he wrote down his theory, that you could have this energy pressure in the universe in accordance with the basic principles of general relativity. He didn't like it too much because he liked to be able to calculate everything. And this very small energy density, uh, who, who he, it would just have to be put in. Well, it would be nice to be able to calculate it, but also be nice to know whether that's really the answer to the accelerated expansion of the universe. And it, it has a profound impact on the future of the universe. We'd all like to know where we come from, what our past is, how did the universe begin, why did it begin the way it began, but equally, how will the universe end? If we understand enough of basic physics, we should be able to predict the end of the universe. In my opinion, that's as 
interesting a question as how did the universe begin. The laws of physics, the basic laws of physics, don't distinguish between past and future. Um, the basic laws of physics are um, time reversal invariant. Change the arrow, run the mu uh, movie backwards over short times for small isolated systems, it looks the same. <clears throat> That's not true of the universe, of course. Anyway, how the universe will end will de depends a lot, crucially, on the nature of dark energy. If it is indeed a cosmological constant and keeps functioning, then this accelerated expansion of the universe will lead to a situation where in roughly 20 billion years from now, you step out at night, you'll see no stars except those in our own Milky Way. The other galaxies will be receding so fast from us, faster than the speed of light, that light cannot reach us from those stars. And it gets even worse 2,000 billion years from now. So, fascinating question, which we're beginning to think about how to answer. Let's go down to a smaller scale, the size of the Earth, kilometers, or hundreds, thousand kilometers. And here, again, is one of the frontiers of modern, of current physics, the nature of black holes. So black holes are regions of space where there is so much matter or energy that gravity holds light inside them. So if you have a very massive star of very small size, the gravitational force is so great that light, like energy, anything that contains energy, is pulled back and can never escape. <coughs> Black holes were originally discovered in Einstein's equations, which had solutions of that type. And most everyone, including Einstein, thought ah, that's, uh, they make no sense, so something will happen. or some, There will be some cure. They'll never form. There was no such thing. But, and astronomers thought they were some crazy speculations of physicists. But now we know that black holes are abundant throughout the universe. There is a black hole, a rather small, as uh, galaxies go, a small black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And we know that because, again, astronomers have mapped quite precisely the orbits of planets around the, this point in the center of the galaxy. And there's nothing there that one can see, nothing that emits light. Uh, even though I'm not, there's enough mass at this point to uh, the same mass as a million suns. So it's believed to be a black hole. In fact, there was a Nobel Prize for that discovery, for that confirmation uh, two years ago. And now such black holes have been observed in every galaxy that we look at. It appears that at every galaxy there's a black hole, usually much more massive than our black hole, and sometimes much more active. They're believed to be the sources of these cosmic gamma ray bursts, not the fast radio bursts that Vicky Caspi was talking about earlier today, but gamma ray bursts that emit very high energy light, gamma rays. Not only that, we have, for the first time, seen gravitational waves that occur when black holes merge, when they collide and form spectacular mergers that emit enormous amounts of energy in waves of gravity. Now, gravity, according to Einstein, is 
the effect of the curvature of space-time. So particles, bullets, planets always move in straight lines, in geodesics, in the shortest path between two points. But because space itself is curved, that path can sometimes be a circle, like the orbit of the Earth, or a deflected light ray passing near the sun. So gravity, and our understanding of gravity is essentially the dynamics of space-time, the curvature of space-time. And it is sourced by objects that have energy. So when I wave my hand like this, well, uh, this isn't very massive, doesn't have much energy, but it does create a little ripple in space-time itself. And the distance between points slightly changes. However, to observe that requires massive energy releases, not just motions like this, but two black holes colliding. <coughs> the LIGO observatory uh, is an interferometer, originally two, the three, now there I think there are four of them, uh, and one can in principle, and in, in practice now, observe what happens if a wave of gravity, of space-time, passes through the Earth? It will change the distance between two points in this axis and in this axis differently. And if you have interference between light going this way and this way, measured here, if you change the le one of these lengths more different from the other, the interference pattern will be slightly modified. And remarkably, remarkable experimental development over 30 years without any data, they are able to measure changes of distance due to possible gravitational waves or a truck going down the road down to distances of one part in a thousand of the size of the proton. It's an unbelievable achievement. And it's now seven years ago that they saw the first evidence of such a gravitational wave passing through the Earth, <coughs> which is interpreted uh, as two colliding black holes which meet, merge, and then form a bigger black hole, which settles down. Now, when this happens, there is so much energy released that within a second or so, this is the brightest object, has more, emits more radiation, more energy, than all the rest of the universe. It's an enormously e explosion where an enormous amount of mass is converted to energy. And that creates this ripple, which travel more than a billion years, light years, to reach us. So that dip has reduced by an enormous amount, and, uh, but still observable in the LIGO experiment. It was observed in the two different interferometers. And these are the readouts. And they match beautifully with the predictions, which require very few parameters. You know, you have to know the mass of the black holes and their, uh, how far away they are and so on, to this template, which is a calculation from Einstein's equations. So Einstein's prediction of gravitational waves was in fact confirmed 100 years after he made it. And there was a Nobel Prize in shortly after, in 2017, I think, um, or 16, 
uh, for this direct observation of waves of gravity, waves of oscillating space-time metric. The detection of gravitational waves has opened a new avenue to explore the universe. And uh, so, sorry, in, in 2017, a few years later, they observed what is interpreted as the collision of two neutron stars that Vicky also talked about, these very compact, dense stars that have collapsed. And when they collide, they presumably form a black hole. But what is nice is that since the neutron stars are not black holes, they're ordinary stars, you can see this event in other ways. And in the days and weeks following that first gravitational wave observation of this event, uh, observatories all across the world and in space saw the same event in all forms of light, electromagnetic radiation, X-ray, ultraviolet, optical, infrared, and radio waves. And uh, from one observation, one has confirmed a pretty popular and theory of how heavy metals, which is what astronomers called all matter made out of atoms heavier than carbon, were formed in the universe. They seem to be products of such mergers of neutron stars, which are neutron rich. So this is an amazingly new field of observational astronomy and astrophysics using waves of gravity. And uh, this will prove to be enormously important for the study of neutron stars, compact objects, black holes, and maybe even enable us to see directly back to the first milliseconds or beyond of the universe as a whole uh, where such waves could have been produced. In fact, we expect that they will be produced and they require much larger interferometers than the li current LIGO uh, observatory. Okay, let's go down now to the atomic scale. So we get, descend by another few, many orders of magnitude to the scale of nanometers, the scale of atoms. And what is remarkable in the last few decades is our increasing understanding and ability to manipulate and control experimentally matter at the atomic scale. Uh, these are individual atoms. And using that, our, both our understanding and our experimental control, we can begin to create new forms of matter, some of which have been created already are of enormous interest and enormous uh, practical application, such as graphene, nanotubes, and so on. One of the frontiers in this effort that's pushing, for, pushing us forward in what's, in con what's called condensed matter physics, the study of uh, atoms and electrons, or now a new field of quantum information is the attempt to build a new kind of computer and keep Moore's law going. You know that Moore's law says that every two years or so, you double the power of computers, which has revolutionized technology and the, our world, our whole world. Uh, but we're reaching the limit with ordinary matter. Uh, the amount of <laughs> transistors, the amount of chips, that, the, si uh, the density of uh, chips, of transistors on chips is getting very close to the limit where uh, there's too much heat produced and uh, where 
we're reaching the size of atoms themselves. Well, we could stop. Uh, some people are very worried about what will happen if Moore's law ends and we're not able to continually increase our, our computing power as we have been for the last 30, 40 years. Uh, but there is a possibility of going way beyond our computing, current computing pattern by taking advantage of some of the strange, weird properties of quantum mechanics by constructing <coughs> quantum computers. This is a, a long way off, but it's coming for sure. Ordinary computers are based on ordinary physics, on classical physics, where we try to manipulate bits of information. So everything can be reduced a la Turing to zero and one. Uh, a system, classical systems with two states which you can switch between and uh, code whatever task you want to perform, an algorithm, put in information, construct a memory. That's fine. <laughs> you can also do this by taking real physical systems like, for example, electrons which, you know, in a magnetic field, they have a little, they're little magnets, electrons. They can point up or down. So you could have electrons pointing up or down as bits in a, in a computer. But electrons are really quantum objects. Uh, and in quantum mechanics, a state of an electron can be up or down or any linear combination. Now I try hard in my talks not to introduce equations or mathematics, so I can't really explain what that means. But in quantum mechanics, these bits can be sort of arrows that point in any direction. It's a, what we call a superposition of up and down. And um, that's a much richer way of storing information. So just thinking about that aspect of it, quantum memories are much more powerful than classical memories. But it turns out way, it's much more interesting than that as was dramatically shown by uh, Peter Shore about 30 years ago, that quantum computers, if they exist, based on these quantum bits of information, could crack the RSA, the security features we have that enable us to transfer money over the internet. They could crack the codes that we use, which are based on factoring large numbers into primes. It's a remarkable idea, and it therefore captured the interest of many people, including governments and banks, uh, which started big efforts to construct such powerful quantum computers, which can do much more interesting things than factor numbers. But it's not easy to construct these quantum computers. Uh, they um, suffer from the fact that this very special superposition, we say, of quantum states is very delicate. And any such system of qubits would inevitably be in contact with everything else around it, the environment. And for the very reason we regard quantum mechanics as weird because we've never seen it in our ordinary life. We don't see it because we're always interacting with an environment that decoheres and makes this quantum state behave like a classical state, which is either up or down, but not both at the same time. It's like Schrodinger's cat is the cats we know are alive or dead, 
and not some superposition of dead and alive cats. It's the environment that turns the quantum computer into a classical computer. So it's a very difficult technological and physics job to construct a functioning quantum computer. That's probably a decade or two off, but it's coming. And meanwhile, the impetus to do that has driven um, the study of the quantum nature of matter at the nanoscale and its utilization to new heights uh, with many advances that will be, have many other uses than uh, computation, including the discovery of new matter and the creation of new forms or what we would call phases of matter that we know about. And all of this is extremely exciting and uh, will shape the technology of this century uh, already is beginning to. Let's go down now to the area which I have worked in, another billion orders, well, nine orders of magnitude to the subnuclear scale. What is it that makes up the nuclei of atoms <coughs> and uh, what makes up what goes beyond that? So at this level, we have what uh, is called the standard model of particle physics, which was completed about four decades ago uh, or so, which is an incredibly successful theory of the elementary particles, the basic constituents of matter, and the forces that act on them. We have measured, identified and measured the properties of the quarks that make up neutrons and protons, the hadrons, the electron and its partner, the neutrino, three families of such quarks and leptons, and we have understood in great detail the nature of the forces that act on these elementary constituents of matter and give rise to atoms, or well, first the nuclei, protons, neutrons, and many other kinds of particles made out of quarks, and then atoms which are made out of nuclei and electrons. The forces that act on these quarks and leptons are, of course, electromagnetism. That is responsible for the forces that act on nuclei and electrons, atomic forces, molecular forces, chemical forces, chemical bonds, all of chemistry and atomic physics. But the forces that create the hadrons themselves, the proton and neutron, are the strong force that acts only on quarks. There's also a weak nuclear force that's responsible for the transmutation of elements, for the fact that a neutron decays to a proton, beta decay, and an electron a neutrino. So these three forces um, con constitute what is called the standard model of elementary particles. It's really more than a model. Uh, it's a, the most successful theory of physics basic theory in physics ever. Its equation, or its basic principle, the Lagrangian from which you can, in principle, calculate just about any property of quarks and leptons, uh, can be put on one t-shirt. And it is unbelievably successful. It explains, as far as we know, every experiment that we carry out today from the edge of the universe to at least a billionth of a billionth of a centimeter 
which we explore with high energy accelerators, and perhaps all the way to that ultimate scale uh, of 10 to the minus 36 centimeters. It really should be called, I call it the standard theory. It has many parameters that we can calculate from, you know, we have to measure, as most theories in physics have, but, uh, but it's incredibly concise. And in principle, and has been tested now in incredible precision over the last 40 years, literally thousands, tens of thousands of experiments have been explained and calculated with this theory, uh, with precision sometimes achieving one part in a trillion. It's a billionth of a billionth. That means there are numbers, there are magnetic moment of the electron or of the muon, partner of the electron, can be calculated with accuracy that requires the 12th digital, uh, the 12th decimal point, which is an unbelievable feat of experiment and of theory. Most precision experiments are at the level of one part in a thousand or one part in 10,000. And my experimental colleagues, frustrated by the success, desperately search for some deviation because that's how they will discover new ignorance, which will lead to new progress, uh, so far unsuccessfully. There are, of course, things that are not described so far by this theory or not in a way we understand, such as dark matter. Uh, but, and there are many mysteries, and all these parameters we would like to calculate to understand why they're there and what their value is. And furthermore, all of these forces that describe the electromagnetic and the weak and the strong force are very similar. And shortly after this theory was completed, people extrapolated and discovered, well, at very high energies, these forces, some are weak, some are strong, look the same. So that initiated or strengthened the uh, search in physics. We always search for trying to unify the force that causes apples to fall and the moon to revolve around the Earth and electricity and magnetism to find a unified description when it's called for. And in the case of the standard model, it seems to be called for, but at an extraordinarily short distance. This suggests that if you were to do experiments at what is very high energy or high frequency or very short distance or short wavelength, you would see not just three different forces, but one unified force. It seems to fit together. But the most interesting part of this extrapolation is that gravity becomes an important force at this distance. Now, gravity is the force we're most aware of because we feel it all the time. Even though it's by far the weakest force at our scale of energies and distance. It takes a whole planet to pull on me so that I can feel the force. With an inside an atom, the force of gravity between the electron and the nucleus is 40 orders of magnitude weaker than the force of electricity and magnetism that holds the atom in the nucleus. <coughs> But the source of gravity is mass. Masses attract gravitationally. Energy attracts, e equals mc squared. Ener mass is just the energy of a body at rest. So if you go to higher and higher energies by this enormous extrapolation, 
the force of gravity gets stronger and stronger. And this suggests that at this scale of energies and distances, gravity and the other forces of nature, these are the only forces we know about, we've observed, we seem to need uh, unified. So that led to this ambitious attempt to construct unified theories, <coughs> which so far we still are asking questions. It led to it and other features of particle physics actually led to string theory, an attempt which turned out to be in a, <coughs> a kind of theory or an approach that unified gravity with the other forces of nature. We still don't know whether that's a, uh, that will turn out to provide the crucial clue, but it's certainly a very strong possibility and it is by far the most active direction in which this dream of unification and of truly understanding quantum gravity uh, is moving. Quantum gravity, even without the goal of unification, poses a fundamental question to fundamental physics. You have a theory of quantum mechanics, which is incredibly successful and necessary for um, atomic and subatomic physics. Gravity is the first force we understood. They must be unified. But if you look at quantum gravity at this very small scale of distances or high energies or strong gravitational fields like black holes, gravity has to do with the dynamics of space-time. And in quantum mechanics, everything is fluctuating. There's uncertainty. Things are space-time itself in, will fluctuate because of quantum mechanics. Now this artistic uh, rendition of what that might look like really means nothing except saying that our classical description of space-time breaks down when quantum effects are included. So perhaps the most fundamental issue that we're facing now in fundamental physics, I believe, is the nature of space and time. Space and time are our most fundamental concepts that we acquire as children in order to navigate the real world, but they are mental constructs. We don't feel space or time. They are ways of trying to understand reality. And it's no surprise that those concepts uh, have undergone many changes in the last century. First with Einstein's special theory of relativity, and then with Einstein's general theory of relativity. But now we're beginning to challenge them in even more fundamental ways, bringing in quantum mechanics. One possibility, which isn't necessarily quantum mechanical, is how many dimensions of space-time are there? Is it just this way, this way, and this way? Maybe there are more. In fact, string theory brought this to front because in some string theory approaches to constructing unified theories, there are naturally six more spatial directions, but you don't see them because they're curled up very small. But if you had a microscope that could look very carefully at this point, this little point here, it would actually not be a point, but something more like this six-dimensional manifold, all curled up, but too small to see. That could be, and in certain string theory approaches, there are beautiful answers to some of these questions we ask and we don't know how to answer. The, why are the forces the ones that we see in the standard model? Why does matter come in this form? What are the values of the quark and electron masses? 
In this picture, they're all determined by geometry, by the shape of these hidden dimensions. Plato would have been excited. One of the big hints and ways we have to approach the quantum nature of space-time is black holes. Not necessarily real black holes, which are very big, and, uh, but black holes that serve as theoretical, for, meet for theoretical Gedanken experiments. And here, one of the challenges was put forward by the late Stephen Hawking, who had shown that black holes don't stay around forever. They actually radiate and eventually disappear in a poof of radiation. And that raises the question of what happens when you throw something into a black hole, when you throw information into a black hole. If the black hole doesn't communicate with the outside world and then disappears, what happens to that information? Is information lost? Now, the um, preservation of information in physics is one of the basic principles of our quantum theory of physics. Uh, Hawking challenged that, and that has been a stimulus for understanding the nature of black holes, which is beginning to tell us a lot about what space-time really is. <laughs> Mostly this understanding comes from string theory. I don't really have time to explain. Uh, but the paradox that Hawking posed, black hole is formed, things fall into it, black hole emits what is called Hawking radiation, evaporates, and then you lose all the information about the stuff that fell in. <coughs> that violates quantum mechanics. So that was a challenge for about 20 years, 20, 30 years, this conflict between the two pillars of our understanding of basic physics. Theory of relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, black holes, quantum mechanics with all of its successes, atomic, molecular, nuclear physics. <coughs> the string theory perspective has, has shown us that there's a kind of duality that there are systems, some of which are not this black hole example, well, even that, where you have two separate descriptions of the same phenomena. It's a very beautiful feature of certain uh, physical, uh, certain of our physical theories, that you can describe the same phenomena in different ways, not at the same time, but Sometimes one picture is good, sometimes the other picture is good, but actually they're equivalent descriptions of the same physics. And in that has led us to discover certain situations where what is a black hole is dual or has an alternate description in terms of a physical system with one fewer spatial dimensions and is an ordinary quantum mechanical situation with no quantum gravity, no gravity at all. Such systems we understand very well and we can solve or put on a computer and information is clearly not lost. And this kind of dual description can be used to demonstrate to Hawking's satisfaction as well that information is not lost. But not only that, to analyze in great detail how that information is preserved in the outgoing radiation and to begin to understand how space is constructed from another system with less space. 
In other situations, all of space, not time, but space, can be reconstructed from a system in which space, there is no space. <clears throat> in other words, we're beginning to develop the tools and understanding of, if you want, what space and time are made of. Uh, this duality, <clears throat> I, here I was describing what this kind of duality is good for. One of the things it's good for is very dear to my heart. It's trying to understand the nuclear force, the strong force mediated by the chromodynamic field. This was, as uh, I said in the introduction, what we discovered almost 50 years ago, the force that holds quarks together, which is very similar, why we try to unify, to the electromagnetic force. It's a force between quarks, say in antiquarks, but it is sourced not by electric charge, there's also an electric force, but a much stronger force is the force sourced by the color label, the color charge of the quarks. Now the, that turns out to be threefold, three colors, uh, and the force is more complicated because of that three charges. And it turns out that the field, analogous to the electric field, is affected by the vacuum. So this is a picture of a quark and an antiquark. If there was no quantum nature of the vacuum, if they were just classical charges, they would behave very much like an electron and an anti-electron with a Coulomb law between them, which would fall off like distance squared, inverse distance squared, and you could pull the electron and anti-electron apart, as you do when you ionize atoms. You pull the electrons out of atoms and they run in wires and do work, and that's what all of our electrical technology is based on. But you can't pull quarks out of nuclei. Nobody's ever pulled a quark out and made the quarks run in wires and do work. And that was one of the great mysteries and one of the things that our discovery of asymptotic freedom solved. Because it turned out that these quarks are living in a very complicated quantum vacuum, which is a kind of medium. And this medium behaves very differently than an electrical medium with a dielectric constant and screening. It, and these lines of field lines, force lines, are squeezed by this vacuum, quantum vacuum, into tubes. And that has many consequences, the most important one being that now the force between the quark and its anti-quark doesn't fall off like inverse distance squared, but remains constant. This is actually a picture of a meson, a quark-anti-quark, being pulled apart in a calculation using QCD. You see these flux, the, all these flux lines of the chromodynamic field are squeezed to a tube instead of spreading out. And then it's a simple calculation to show that the energy it takes to create, pull this tube apart, increases linearly. The force is constant. And it would take an infinite amount of energy to ionize a meson or ionize uh, a uh, nucleon that we call confinement. 
So this is a picture of the nucleon, the proton, which is made out of three quarks. When you try to pull them apart, these flux lines, the field lines, are confined to these tubes, which are joined by this junction. And again, it would take an infinite amount of energy to separate them, which is why you've never seen quarks. And you can't pull them out of the proton. And there are no quark currents or quark machines. However, if I were to heat this room to about 100 million degrees centigrade, well, that would be pretty nasty. One of the things that would eventually happen would be that all the protons, that neutrons that make up 99% of your mass, the nuclei of all your atoms, would melt and they would melt into quarks and to the quanta of the chromodynamic field. And then, well, you wouldn't be around, but quarks would exist, much like electrons and light rays. And this, notice these uh, flux tubes are made out of look very much like fat strings. In fact, the reason string theory got its first, got going, was that people tried to construct a theory of hadrons based on these kinds of flux tubes, strings. <coughs> anyway, so coming back to space and time, what we have learned in exploring both quantum gravity, string theory, is that all the features of space-time, of geometry, of space, that we learn as infants and hold on to, to function and describe the world, in quantum gravity and string theory, are suspect. The fact that space is smooth and not crumpled or singular or has cusps doesn't have to be the case in these quantum gravity or string theory. The actual topology of space, the number of holes in the manifold, doesn't have to be fixed. There can be transitions that change the topology even the number, the notion of the dimensions of space, how many dimensions are there, can depend on what you're looking at. Can be described with different dimensions depending on the physics question you're asking or the energy or distance scale you're exploring. So most of my colleagues believe that space-time is an emergent concept, a crude concept, fine for describing most of what we experience or can currently measure, but ultimately isn't fundamental and breaks down at short distances or high energies or strong gravitational fields like black holes. It should be thought of as an emergent concept, as well as gravity, which is the dynamics of space and time. And then, of course, we must ask what and what is the framework that describes physics where space and time aren't primary? And that's very difficult. It's not so difficult with respect to space, but time? To try to formulate an emergent time is not easy. Okay, I'm getting pretty out on a limb, and I'm going to end by discussing a final theory, but uh, I always take solace in this encouragement of Einstein, who once said, the successful attempt to derive delicate laws of nature for a theorist like me along a mental path by following a belief in the formal unity of the structure of reality encourages, he was encouraged, to continue doing what he did his whole life in this speculative direction. 
the dangers of which everyone vividly must keep in sight who dares follow it, which is so true. So I'm going to finally end by asking the question, you know, asking pretty difficult questions, the origin of the universe, the nature of space-time, unifying all the forces. Is this going to go on forever? Maybe not. Maybe we could construct a final theory, what's sometimes called a theory of everything. Maybe the questions we're asking are just too difficult. Are we too dumb to succeed? So I'm going to try to address very briefly these two issues. And then, of course, the final issue, which I'm less hopeful about is, or don't have any good answers for, are we going to, as a species, continue to have the will to proceed? So first, can we construct a final theory? Um, so I like to, physicists like to geometrize their understanding of nature. So I want to discuss the geometry of knowledge. There's a popular model of knowledge which I call the onion model. So exploring nature is like peeling an onion layer by layer in an attempt to get to the core of reality. Well, to my mind, this picture doesn't capture the true nature of knowledge and its pursuit. More appropriate picture is the one I described before. We are immersed in a sea of ignorance and with the aid of science, we push outward, enlarging the realm of knowledge. So uh, that was the picture I described before, but let me make it a little more precise. Knowledge is contained in this sphere of knowledge and immersed in the sea of ignorance. Now, with this, this sphere of knowledge has expanded enormously in the last 100,000 years, especially the last 1,000 years, especially the last 100 years, especially the last 10 years, especially. Most of the knowledge is in the middle here, in books, in the library up on the hill, or nowadays in our iPhones, accessible to everyone although not contained in everyone's head. And scientists really spend most of their time here at the boundary of knowledge and ignorance. Now we're not, we in principle know everything in this sphere and nothing out here, except on the boundary where we're aware of that there's a boundary and that there are questions. So in this picture, knowledge increases like the volume of the sphere not necessarily two-dimensional, maybe 27-dimensional, but whatever. Whereas ignorance, we're only aware of the ignorance at the boundary. We only know enough to ask questions which are here. So ignorance is increasing like the area of the surface of the sphere of knowledge. So that's the, roughly speaking, you can get much more elaborate the, theory of the geometrization of knowledge. And it explains a fact which you are all aware of, which is the more you know, the more ignorant you are, the more aware you are of things you don't know. Somewhat frustrating when you're young, uh, but wisdom increases, even though ignorance is increasing, because, at least for a flat geometry like this, uh, the volume to surface ratio increases. Volume increases faster than the surface of it. So now that we have a geometrical model that has explained this phenomena that we're all aware of, we can ask, can we construct a finite theory, a final theory, say, of physics, of fundamental physical nature? And that translates into, is there a finite amount of ignorance? A 
final theory would, in principle, in a reductionist sense, explain everything. No more ignorance left. Now, this has happened before, the exploration of the Earth. This is a Eurocentric picture of the Earth in the Middle Ages. This was the sphere of knowledge, the area of the Earth that people knew and drew maps of and explored. And then there was the sea of ignorance. And very little was known what lay outside the sphere of knowledge, except on the boundary. <coughs> Some people believed in a flat earth. Then there would be an infinite amount of ignorance, an infinite region out here, and the map of the earth would never be finished. There would never be a final map. But of course, as we knew and they discovered, the earth was, the earth is round. And Exploration ended. Finally, the surface of the Earth was completely explored. And one can say that there is a final map of the Earth, at least a resolution of a meter or two, and you can find it on Google Maps. So we have a final map of, of the surface of the Earth. So the question about whether there's a final theory of science, of physics, is is the sea of ignorance compact? It could be unbounded and infinite, like a flat earth, or it could be bounded and compact, like the earth. I don't know the answer. I'm agnostic. Could be either way. How can you tell? The only thing you can do currently is look for curvature. If you're high enough up, you can see that the Earth is curved. You could see that the sphere of knowledge is curved. What would be the indication of that? Well, on a curved Earth, sooner or later you get to the point, halfway through your exploration, that the amount of ignorance gets smaller instead of getting bigger. There is no sign that that is happening. There is no sign of curvature. Certainly in my experience, and I think all of ours, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know. So that's a sign so far, no curvature. But who knows? It could be temporary, and it could be, like the surface of the Earth, Finally, we begin to run out of new questions. We just have to complete. And uh, we might end up with a temporary and then for, continue to check and test a final fundamental understanding of the basic laws of physics. Would that be the end of physics or of science? Of course not. This is only the end in some kind of very crude reductionist sense where we have discovered, certainly so far, that uh, reductionism does pertain to our picture of the physical universe. And if we had a final theory, that might be final in that sense that the other... Uh, the understanding we already have, which would then have a, some kind of final explanation, uh, is still infinitely rich. <coughs> Not only is the reductionist, this reductionist picture confirmable, it can't be disproved, one could try, so far one hasn't succeeded, of finding phenomena that here don't have their explanation at more fundamental levels, but it is totally impractical. So nobody who's doing, say, chemistry or condensed matter physics or 
uh, uses the standard model. The elements they use of the theories that are at the basis of, say, stellar structure or chemistry are not in conflict with, and we would believe could, in principle, be derived from our more fundamental or reductionist uh, theories, but it's totally impractical and useless. But even if we discover this final form of the fundamental laws of nature, the myriad of wonderful emergent behavior and infinite complexity and structure would still uh, be there to discover and use. Okay, well, can, but can we even imagine arriving at a final theory if there is a final theory? We may be too dumb to proceed. We're very aware <coughs> that uh, our fellow species are too dumb to proceed. Now, we understand that there are questions that we ask and explore and discover and invent that horses and dogs cannot. I've been totally unable to teach my dog quantum mechanics. And we easily understand that dogs are not going to be able to understand quantum mechanics. They don't have the mental tools. But why should we be so arrogant to believe that Homo sapiens, who've been around for a million years, a hundred thousand years, have somehow reached the ultimate peak of evolution and have the capability to understand <coughs> black holes and the origin of the universe and the nature of space and time. We certainly didn't evolve to do that, did we? <coughs> so maybe we're reaching the limits of our ability to understand some of these fundamental questions. Well, I don't think so. I think I'm pretty optimistic. Partly because the one thing we have that distinguishes us from our fellow species is language, whose most advanced form is mathematics. And language, as Chomsky pointed out, has infinite capacity. A newborn, an infant, after about six months can, or maybe a year, can make up sentences, pronounce sentences that no one has ever uttered before. Language has, and mathematics have a certain infinite capacity. Now, there are many kinds of infinity, and maybe it's not enough. But I think that if we run into such difficulties, we will do what humans have always done, and figure out another way around, like taking advantage of these things we have discovered how to build, merging with machines, or, effect, or changing our genome. But in any case, observationally, just as today there's no sign of curvature in the geometry of, of knowledge, there's no sign that we're at, faced now with questions that cannot be answered. If it were the case that we were getting close to the point where the questions are too difficult for humans, much as quantum mechanics is too difficult for dogs, I think we would begin to know that. One way of knowing it would be that it would take young people, graduate students, longer and longer to get to the frontiers of knowledge. Instead of getting their PhD at the age of 25 or 28, they'd get it at the age of 68. It'd take longer and longer. Eventually, it would be impossible to ever get to the stage where they could continue to create new knowledge because the questions would be too difficult. There is no sign of that. Even though the questions we ask appear to be getting more harder and harder. As far as I can tell, young people regard them, well, they're just like 
same way I regarded the, what I now see as much simpler questions 50 years ago. So finally, I think the real danger of going on forever or continuing this quest for the ultimate, perhaps illusory, final understanding of physical reality is that we may lose the will and the means to go on. Uh, in fundamental physics, experimental particle physics, astrophysics, cosmology, we seem to be approaching limits of resources and perhaps will of our fellow citizens to foot the bill for these increasingly expensive probes of fundamental science. And we can only hope that we can go on. And I'd like to end by quoting David Hilbert, the eminent mathematician, mathematical physicist, who on his grave has written, we must know, we will know. Thank you. So thank you very much for this extraordinary and inspiring lecture. I think that this audience is really very privileged to have the opportunity to come today here to this place to listen to such an extraordinary um, speech. Uh, I think we are running out, I'm afraid we are running out of time, but if there is an urgent question, I would like to to urge you to place it. I have some difficulties in... Is there any question? Yes? Can you come or...? These are students. Yeah, it's good. They have an auto price here. So please, can you... Hello. Um, uh, first of all, we're really thankful for our presence here, and we, it really was a pleasure to watch our presentation. And um, earlier you mentioned the uh, end or the future of the universe, and me and my friend here, my colleague, we managed to create a creation. Okay, so our question was basically, uh, what do you think that will be the the, the future of our universe, if it will end or what it will be? I wish I knew. You see, uh, one thing, well, so in physics, in principle, if we know the situation at the present and we know the laws of physics, we can predict the future. Um, so we know the universe is expanding. I can tell you what will, the universe will look like in a billion years from now. Or my friends, the astronomers, can do that. We're going to collide with another galaxy in a few billion years. The sun will become a red giant in a few billion years. So there are many predictions one can make about our local environment. Uh, in the universe. But the universe as a whole is one kind of object, space-time. And its history uh, we know quite a bit about from the past 13 billion years, but not the beginning. And we not even sure that since we're unsure of what it would mean to understand the beginning, it personally seems to me equally unsure what it would mean to predict the end. So, because the laws of physics, you know, don't have an arrow of time in them. And um, so what we could do would be to do what physics normally does and say, we know something about the present. 
we know a lot about the laws of physics, but not all, and uh, predict the future. Then it depends a lot on this so-called dark energy. And as I said, if that remains constant and isn't sort of dissipating, it's pretty dark, I mean, pretty awful end, <laughs> because the universe expands so rapidly, eventually every atom will be in its own separate universe, or part of this universe, unable to communicate with any other atom. So I'm talking not short periods like 10 billion years, but a billion billion years. Eternity is awfully long, as Woody Allen said, especially towards the end. So, but I'm not sure that we should be asking this question in this standard way. It might be we'll understand that there's some principle, some understanding that dictates the beginning as well as the end. Uh, but anyway, this is really as far out speculation as one can go. Thank you very much. Let's thank again Professor Gross. So. Uh, I'm sorry, do you have time to just a really brief question? Sure. So, I would just like to repeat, thank okay. you for the organization, uh, thanks the organization for such a marvelous experience and one of, uh, in a lifetime uh, opportunity to be here. Uh, and also thank you Dr. David Gross actually for the opportunity of coming here and give this wonderful lecture. Now, my question will be very brief. You started out by asking uh, what, by your presentation by asking what did we learn in the previous 50 years? Uh, I would like to, if you could, give me a quick list of predictions of the reverse question, that is, what do you think we will be, what we will we be able to discover in 50 years? That is, will we be able like to, uh, find out the mystery behind, uh, behind confinement or maybe even solve the Navier-Stokes equations or uh, what are the problems you think we'll be able to solve? Thank you. Well, um, so actually predictions, as, as the great American philosopher Yogi Berra said, predictions are very difficult, especially about the future. Um, Actually, I believe the predictions of what will happen in basic science are easier than predictions about what will happen in technology or, unfortunately, politics, uh, because they're really defined by the questions we asked. So it's my experience that the questions, that once a question is well formulated, by which I mean it can be addressed by observation and by experiment and by theoretical tools, it will be answered in your lifetime. You're young enough. So uh, 50 years, I think the, all the questions, or most of the questions, maybe not the origin of the universe or the end of the universe, but most of the questions that I raised here and many others, fascinating questions, uh, will be answered in 50 years. That's an awful long time uh, from the point of view of modern science. Assuming, of course, that the unknowns like the economy and politics give us the means to continue, they'll be answered, every single one of them. That was my experience. and. Uh, I have no doubt that that will continue. So any question that can be. Now, some of the questions that I formulated, not space and time, for example, I think will be answered, already is beginning to be answered, in ways that will surprise us and astonish us and give us a very a stronger foundation, perhaps, for answering questions like the origin of the universe. 
But a question like the origin of the universe, I'm not sure is yet well formulated. Because it's a kind of question that's never had to be asked or has been asked or there's any model for what an answer would look like uh, so far. But all the other ones, yes, they'll all be answered.